ghosts, UFOs, alien encounters, and all things paranormal. These are real stories from real people. This is Fear of the Unknown. I'm here with my big brother, Martin. Hi. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to talk about growing up in like the most spook-free house <laughs> and family you could imagine. But um, like at this point in your life, you know, when it comes to the paranormal, what's your, what's your kind of view on it? Or what's your belief, rather? Well, right now, at this point in my life, I, I'm open to it. I'm open-minded. I, I, I'm, I've recently abandoned my desire to, to, to rule things out. I don't, I don't want to see things in black and white anymore. Uh, I think it's part of growing up. I've, I've learned to appreciate that not everything is necessarily um, definable using duality. I don't think stuff is necessarily a case of it definitely exists or it definitely doesn't. Yeah. Um, so gun to your head, what do you believe in? <laughs> <laughs> gun to my head. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So without getting too uh, metaphorical or too, that's not even the word I want, without getting too sort of, you know, blah, blah about it. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a list. Okay. UFOs. Mm-hmm. I believe in them. Yep. Aliens. Probably believe in them. Uh-huh. I think, okay, 100% being totally believing and 0% is like no way. Mm-hmm. UFOs, 100%. Yep. Aliens, 70%. Okay, that's fair enough. Ghosts, oh, it's under 50% for me. Okay, yeah. But it's not zero. Yeah. But definitely not above 50% belief. Yeah. What else? Um, all the various cryptozoological things that are out there. Yeah. There's a lot out there. That's something I haven't really talked about yet. Yeah. Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. Oh, and, and like, what about Skinwalkers and Mothman and yeah. so much, there's so much stuff. Um, ooh, I reckon I'm, I'm hovering at around 55, 60%. Belief. Ooh, damn. Because. That's, that's way more than I expected from you. Well, okay. You know, if. We're supposed to be healthily skeptical about everything because, yeah. you know, we're all so damn enlightened now because science and, you know, we're all euphoric in this moment, etc. cetera. You're, so, you're sounding like me now. <laughs> <laughs> damn. Yeah. Am I going to have to change the tone of my voice to... <laughs> as, as the older brother, maybe I should <laughs> speak a little higher now. Um, what was I saying? I forget. But, yeah, look, um, a, a lot of it... You're talking about... Um, Skepticism. Yeah, skepticism. Yeah. So I think the stuff that people see, I believe that they saw what they saw. Right? Yeah. I believe that they, they, they've they seen something weird and maybe they've taken a photo of it or they've captured it or something yep. in some way, like, you know, like a, a, I don't know, like a phone video or whatever. Yeah. But I'm not necessarily sold on what it is. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it is some uncatalogued, Organism, some some kind of creature we don't know about, or maybe it could be explained. Mm-hmm. That that's where my, uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of above the fifty percent threshold on that, you know, <laughs> because it's it's definitely yeah. something, but we just don't know necessarily what. Yeah. I think what bothers me, um, and I've said this before about skepticism, is when someone goes, "I saw a man with a big trench coat with glowing red eyes standing in a tree," and you know, and then they say, oh, well, you know, there is a type of owl that has reflective, uh, you know, retina. And uh, it, that's probably what they saw. Like when, yeah, that's the, that's the most annoying type of skepticism. You know, even, even if people say like, okay, this person has been on meds for many years and, and that kind of takes away the legitimacy or the plausibility. To I've, me, to me, that always feels a little bit, a little bit desperate, a little bit like a, a, a bit of an exorcism. Yeah. Um, like they want to take away the spooky because we're uncomfortable with spooky. Yeah. Maybe we need to learn to be comfortable. Yeah. With feeling that little that little slight twinge of fear about something. Yeah. Maybe maybe that's normal. Maybe we should just allow yeah. ourselves to be familiar with it. Yeah. You know. 
I mean, there's probably some understanding to be gained through not trying to sweep it under the carpet all the time. You know? Of course. That's the, and another example of that is like, it's only a few years ago that the US government, um, at first it was leaked, but then they properly declassified this alien or this UFO footage mm. that goes totally against physics, you know, like the way it was moving around, the way it was shot and everything. And they're just like, what is this? And they admitted you know, what is it? And the first thing that scientists do is that they go like, okay, fair enough. Okay. We admit that there's UFOs finally. Okay. We admit it. However, that doesn't mean that there's aliens, you know? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think it's like, it's okay to say like, well, it doesn't mean that there's aliens, but it doesn't mean that there's not aliens. You just, they, they just want to still have that kind of, kind of smug, like, you know, we, we still know better than everyone else. It's carrying on the fine tradition of we can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah that this is happening or has happened or did. Yeah, I know. But the way they say it is like, look, it doesn't necessarily mean there's aliens, okay? But, you know, we don't think it's aliens because aliens go against, you know, the periodic table of elements or whatever scientific people say. Yeah. I just made myself sound so stupid just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, of course, the periodic table has, it offers, you know, irrefutable proof that aliens don't exist because elements... Look, I mean, it's I, all in the atomic weight. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! But okay. anyway, like, um, look, growing up with us, nothing really s- spooky happened. But you, I remember you telling me, like, over the years, you've said that there was a point in your childhood where you were just like, "I'm afraid of being abducted," and you were like, se- really serious. You were dead serious about being afraid of being abducted when by you were young. aliens. By aliens, by greys, right? Yeah, greys. Tell yeah. me about that. Well. That was a long time coming, actually, when I think back on it, because I think like every, like a lot of uh, young kids growing up, at some point you, you, you find the paranormal section of your school library. Yeah. So I remember there were these great books. I think they were like Osborne classics. Yeah. There were these books that were like a big A4 format, you know, lots of yeah. pictures, lots of really crappy illustrations of you know, like a, a reptoid yeah, like here's one of the one of the, one of the lizard people, and this is a grey, and this is you know all the different types yeah. of aliens, the 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 Nordic elf looking alien, and then this blob that looks like a rock or a big pile of shit or something. I don't know what it is, you know. And so, yeah, you know, a catalogue of all the different aliens that people have seen, and this is what their homeworld might look like. And it was just some ridiculous <laughs> illustration of some alien planet that yeah. just had no yeah. basis. In fact, it was just pure fantasy. Yeah, uh, but I. The first time I, I saw one of these books in the library, I would have been, ah, uh, I would have easily been like seven or eight years old. So mm. I, I ate it up. I borrowed that book. And I remember I, I re borrowed it two or three times because I was just so into this book and I was just flicking through the pages and like, I was completely taken by this, this idea that there was something on a, you know, something that was life. Yeah from a different planet in space, you know, mm-hmm. which was totally at odds with our religious upbringing because we were taught to believe in, yeah. a, in a, I guess, a pretty much a creationist universe. Yeah. And we are the only ones that have been created. Yeah. Yeah, and so forth. I think we barely believed in dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think there was a point where... They just, didn't even, they just avoided that topic, I think. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. What, do you, what do you do out of fossil record? Um, yeah. Yeah, modern day creationists have come up with some amazing explanations mm. to get themselves out of that little corner. But yeah. I, I don't want to start talking about religion. that's another thing. I mean, I'd, I'd happy, I'd happily listen to a creationist give me their theory. I think that would be fascinating to listen to. I would, I, I would never mock anyone's beliefs. I think it's like it's either interesting or it's really cool, or it's just like you know. Well, creationists just, just to get it all out there. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe you should find a creationist. To, yeah, to talk even if to I'd that. love to speak to a flat earther. I mean, I don't believe it personally, but I, I just want to want to hear him talk. I want to I want to hear what they believe. Yeah, and to get a flat earther's view on things like uh, UFOs and aliens and stuff. I mean, yeah. how would they see all that? Yeah, you know, um, how much of it is, how much of what they see is tied up in conspiratorial thinking? Yeah, or or, or not. Yeah. But um, but yeah. So so back to this this book in the library. I was completely right, right. taken by this book, and I was you know, obsessed with it. And that was the start of a lifelong fascination with horror as well, because mm-hmm. that was when I first felt a bit unsettled by something, a little mm-hmm. bit like, oh, hang on, this is this is a little bit scary. But I didn't understand what it was. But I was kind of 
I think I got instantly addicted to this. This you get addicted to the willies. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's that's a really unfortunate turn of phrase, <laughs> but um, let, let's let's go with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> heebie-jeebies. The heebie-jeebies. Yeah. So yeah, and, and you yeah, know, growing up, I spent a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't let it go. Go on. A lot of time with willies. Um, no. no, that's terrible. No, go on, go on. Yeah, so I, I was interested in, in aliens for a, like a, a good a good long time. Yeah. And eventually that was replaced with, I don't know, I, I was interested in building model airplanes for yeah. a while. That was my world for a good while. And then eventually that was replaced with music and so forth. Yeah. But at some point, I remember I was I was 13 years old and... Yeah, it would have been 13 or 14, something like that. And the movie Fire in the Sky came out. Yeah. And I, I hadn't seen the movie, but... It is a true... It's a, it's based on a true story. It's it's the most compelling and the, like with the most evidence um, of an alien abduction that happened to this guy, Trevor Wallace. Right. Yeah. I he, see. Him and, and his co-workers that were, they were lumberjacks, they were like coming back from a day of chopping wood. Yep. And they saw like um, a light in the in the trees, and they thought it could be a like a lightning strike fire. Yep. So they, th- you know, they thought, well, let's go and try and put it out if it's there. Mm. They saw a UFO. Uh, the guy Trevor Wallace got out. He'd ha- he unf- it's just like a bad coincidence. He was like feeling all sulky at the time because he had a fight with one of these co-workers. So he was a, in a bad mood. Yeah, over a girl. Right. So he got out, and they're like. Dude, get back in the car. Don't be an idiot. And he's like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check this thing out. So he walks up to it and he gets hit by a... Uh, he gets too close. He gets hit by a tractor beam, which sends him flying through the air. The instant it touches him, he gets launched through the air and everyone thinks he's dead. So they just bail. Shit. Hang on. So you're giving a synopsis for the movie now. Yeah, I'm just telling people so what they, what they know is going on. Oh, okay. So like you've seen it or is this the... Are you t- telling the movie or are you I'm telling, telling... I'm telling the actual story. The story, okay. Yep. Yeah. And he wakes up in at a different UFO because the UFO was much smaller, the one that he originally saw. Right. He woke up in like a kind of alien facility. Okay. And he was being sort of um, operated on or he was being healed. He had injuries that they were kind of healing him. Oh, okay. Um, it was Gray's and he kind of had a bit of an adventure there. Anyway, long story short, he came across Gray's. He came across like some of these Nordic aliens as well. Um, they managed to subdue him because he was like he was flipping out. Right. He even tried to run into another room and he sat in a chair with controls and tried to press all the buttons and stuff to you know find a way to escape. Wow. And apparently he's like really low oxygen there, so the whole time he was like super panicking. Shit. Okay. And he just woke up naked next to a restaurant um, at some time during the night, and and it was five days that had passed. The police thought that this dude that he had a fight with had murdered him shit and they all did polygraph tests they all passed and they have no other explanation for it and the same thing that always happens where the military comes in they go um shut up about this don't talk about it you know they do all all sorts of threats um like they're usually empty threats but they say don't talk about it aliens don't exist ufos don't exist yeah yeah so that's the story of it the movie sort of changes a few of the details, but it's essentially the same. Yeah, right. Yeah. That, that, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I haven't heard the full story of that before. Yeah. Um, but at the time, um, so back to the the, yeah. the, the thing, I was, I was 13 and I saw previews. Um, I might have seen it on TV or something. There might have been like a promo for that movie Fire in the Sky on TV mm-hmm. or maybe I saw it at a movie cinema or something, maybe a preview or something. Yeah. And um, it, it it struck a chord with me. Like, it, it terrified mm. me. And I, I wasn't a kid that was really easily scared of stuff. Like, I, I was pretty comfortable with the idea of, of horror, you know, like, yeah. as we understood it, you know, like, things like um, like movies like Nightmare on Elm Street and all that sort of stuff. That That's... I, I grew up with that generation of horror movies being discussed at school and people watching him and stuff you know we'd watch him after school and all that sort of thing yeah um so yeah like horror was wasn't like wasn't enough to give me the wheelies like monsters and supernatural things didn't didn't sorry give me the heebie-jeebies <laughs> no willies no i think i think willies is the term that we're going to be using <laughs> for the rest of this podcast. um yeah but yeah for some reason the thought of getting abducted like seeing 
I remember there was a, a scene. It's like a, a f- I know like the one. A yeah. half second, <laughs> half second shot of a dude struggling underneath what looks like a plastic sheet that's holding him down, and it looks like he can't breathe. And you see some kind of a spinning instrument or something mm-hmm. getting lowered down onto this dude, and he's struggling. You know, that that's fucking horrifying. Yeah. You know, like that. <laughs> that actually like had me legitimately scared. And like, and like and they, a, they, a little little thirteen year old Marty was just like, <laughs> I went into this weird sort of. For about two weeks, I remember I was in a weird, almost dissociative state. No, not not dissociative really, but I kind of I, I didn't feel like I was in myself i was so scared and i was sleeping so badly and so preoccupied with Mm. the thought of getting abducted Mm -hmm. especially at night so i couldn't really sleep um i was i felt like i was just observing my life you know rather than living my life and i remember it lasted for about two weeks it was a strange feeling it lasted like all day as long as i was awake i just felt i I don't know it's like i was in some kind of weird state of anxiety or something i don't know uh, this may really sound, strange. This may sound silly, but a lot of people, when it comes to aliens, even just talking about UFOs and stuff, like you can talk about other like horror concepts, yeah, and they'll be just like, "Oh, that's that's a bit scary, or that's pretty chilling." Yeah, but f- for some people, and I'm not going to say, you know, that it's it's your that it's in your case it's so, but a lot of people have extremely strong feelings of deja vu. And realism and PTSD when it comes to the um, the subject of UFOs. Oh, really? Yeah, that's really interesting. You um you watched that documentary, Witness to Another World. I did. The yes. Other day. Yeah, just the other day. Yeah. I didn't finish watching it, but like you need to to watch it to the end. Yeah. It's got a actually, yeah, and to whoever to whoever is listening as well, mm. uh, look it up and and watch it. It's um, it's, it's it, Witness to or Witness of Another World, or something like that. I think it's Witness to another world yeah but it's about um that boy growing up in south america who went out to check on his father's herd of sheep or something and has an alien encounter Mm. in a in a field like he sees a a ufo and actually went up into the ufo and saw climbed a ladder climbed a ladder that's right climbed a ladder up into the ufo and he said it was really interesting because the ladder was really really cold to the touch which is a detail which I would not have expected, but apparently it's super cold. And he climbed, he, he did, but not so cold he couldn't hold on to it, so he climbed up. And he went inside the UFO, but just just inside the threshold of the, of the, the hatch or the opening in the side of the UFO, in, in the side of the craft. And there was a some kind of a force field or, or a, a surface he couldn't walk through because he, he saw something happening inside. And he tried to walk into this and he kind of it felt like he'd walked into a glass door or something, just like mm. like a, a, a bump and he couldn't get through it. So, But he couldn't see anything. So it seems like there was something made of glass or a force field or something. But inside he saw um, a creature that looked like it was preparing food, like a creature that was just cutting up some meat mm-hmm. and another creature that was kind of acknowledging him and stuff. And so he was given this opportunity to, to just have a look inside the spaceship and then something indicated to can him. I, can I just uh, say something yeah. about this? I've watched the first part of this. This poor man is not lying. <laughs> he believes what he saw. He's got like, he's got all the signs of, of genuine PTSD. Like this uh, guy cries every single time he talks about it. Yeah, and that, that's one his thing voice that's is kind really of like obvious. his voice has been arrested to like it sounds still very youthful. Yeah, that's interesting. and he's a grown man, and that's one of the things that happens to people that like suffer trauma. I mean, this at man age. At, at the time of this movie, he looks like he's easily in his late forties or fifties. Yeah, I think the incident happened in nineteen seventy eight. Mm-hmm. So he was eleven or twelve at the time. Yeah. I was born in 1979, which means I'm 40 now. Yeah. That means he would be in his early 50s. But And his voice sounds like a child. It like, is chilling, though. Like, he kind of it, talks like this and everything. Is yeah. Like, it's a bit like a Michael Jackson almost, you know, like the way kind he talks. Of, kind of. But he doesn't have that uh, that creepiness. Like, he seems no. like a very... He doesn't have that gruffness that you develop as you grow up. It's 
It sounds like really, really youthful. That's the only way I can explain it. Yeah. It's not high pitched. It's like so. Yeah. So it seems like, like you said, he was. He's a PTSD sufferer, and he seems to be arrested in a. His development is in stuck in a childlike sort of state because this happened when he was a child still, and it was such a such an impactful experience. And I mean, he'd, not, never, not, he'd never heard of UFOs or anything. So. I had no no idea what was going on. He had yeah. no basis for comparison. Even up until just before they um, asked him to do the the interview, yeah, he still didn't know what, like didn't well, know that other people had experienced this. Type his of thing. his first round of interviews when he was maybe a teenager, yeah. So, which is a few decades ago now. So, and then the documentary takes place in the present day, probably shot, you know, within a couple of years ago, I guess. Right. And um, and it catches up with him as an adult and just tries to get a little bit of um, uh, a bit of detail about you know what was going on. And, and mm. I've got to say, the the documentary maker um, is very sympathetic to the guy, so yeah. he's, he's not sort of exploiting his story or anything like that. Yeah. But I, I don't want to give too much away sure. because. Um, it's definitely worth a look. Definitely yeah. worth checking out. And but you would sorry before I interrupted you. Yep. You were talking about the encounter itself. Yeah, the encounter itself. Yeah, like yeah. And I guess the details of the encounter are not. They don't appear to be all that significant, apart from the fact that it it almost seemed to be a a look at a just a scene of domesticity inside of a, a spacecraft. Mm-hmm. Right. One of them was cooking something. You know, it was just cutting up some meat. Yeah, um, and it's an interesting detail cutting up meat, you know. Yeah, uh, and somebody asked him, so was it was there blood? What was like, you know, the, as, as though the question was to imply was there some kind of carnage occurring? It's like yeah. no, it was just just you know just a piece of meat. Mm-hmm. I guess you know if someone carves up some steak to cook at home or something, that that's yeah. that's what it seemed to be. And then the encounter ends with um, him. I think he was communicating telepathically. Yeah. Um, with one of them, and yeah. he it was made known to him that it was time for him to leave, mm-hmm. and um, and so he he scrambled out of the the spacecraft as quickly as he could. Uh, it, it seems like he almost got trapped inside because the the, the, the door mm. was closing on him or something like that, and and yeah, you know, then and apparently the the horse he was riding uh, injured itself on the the ladder because it got upset or something and it died the next day or something yeah it yeah. died a couple of days, the next day or a couple of days after which is a strange thing in itself and he so, he got in trouble for that you know so that was yeah. also part of his PTSD that his father was super angry with him for like the getting horse, the getting the horse the horse dying you know? yeah. this is just a rural family a horse is probably a big deal it's like someone crashing a car or something you know like but a lot of those details that you were mentioning he was only able to access through like regressive hypnotherapy right uh I don't know that it was only through the the, the hypnotherapy. I think um, I think he had a clear memory of that stuff, and yeah. I think the hypno the scene with the hypnotherapy <coughs> is actually more therapeutic. So making him access the memories, but under the guidance of the therapist, so encouraging him to okay. to, to face his fear and not. I'm gonna have to watch it for myself because I've I yeah. heard. I've only heard interviews with the filmmaker about the making of it. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, it's worth saying, and yeah. it's 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 a very sad situation. Like he's obviously a guy who's suffering a lot with his PTSD and the torment that he's you yeah. know, he's been through. Oh, that's clear from the from the first mm. moment. Yeah. Uh, but it has a it has a happy ending. It's, it's, it's actually quite a beautiful ending. So yeah. I, I definitely recommend you see it. But I guess the point is that it's um. I don't think you can easily say that. It's it's a it's a lie, mm. or that what he describes might be possible to be, um, you know, explained with some kind of a, a known phenomenon. Yeah, you know, it's it's not like a, an owl with reflective eyes in a tree. Like this mm. is a pretty clear physical thing that happened to him. You know, mm-hmm. but I mean, look to give a little bit away about the ending. Um, he does. Um, re-establish ties with his roots because the the boy was um, he did have a lot of native blood, I believe. Yeah. It was it Colombian or where, where was the story? So I, I can't remember. Like, but like he so, lived basically, he lived his life as a hermit, just with animals, right? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Because he was unable to have like normal friendships with people or relationships because yeah. he was just so fucked up from what happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he, he kind of reestablishes his, his tribal roots and, 
um, a lot of the answers to his resolution lies in um, the spirituality of his tribe, uh, in, yeah. you know, like through the guidance of a, a shaman, and um, and there's a ritual that they undergo. It's like a naming ritual, I guess. And so many, so many cultures have rites of passage that are along those lines. You know, like a, a you know to, to to find someone's name, yeah, or to find your totem or something like. Yeah, you know, so many cultures have that. Cultures have that type of thing. Yeah. So he he undergoes a similar process, and that that sort of you know. Yeah, helps to bring about a resolution. And I've so just interesting. Given away the ending. Because so. <laughs> all to, the, all of this stuff always brings up the thought of um, dimensions and dimensionality, mm. like in in its nature, you know. Yeah. And I have a suspicion that one day we're going to figure out that a lot of spiritualism <coughs> is just a a deeper form of uh, you know it's it's within the realm of science. It's just something that hasn't been discovered yet. You know? As though what we think of as being extraterrestrials from a different location in the universe, uh, maybe just um, from a different mm. frame of reference or yeah. a different dimension or yeah. you know, attach sciencey sounding jargon here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe it's just a matter of... Uh, like vibrational frequencies, man, or something. Could know? be. And like, yeah, I say it flippantly, but maybe it, it, it does amount to something like that. Yeah. Maybe the what we see as aliens have just got the technology to move between one space of existence and another, you know. Maybe mm-hmm. it's not great distances that are being travelled. Maybe it's just um, different dimensions. But I mean, I, I, I don't want to use the word dimension. I feel it's... It's kind of oversimplified and overused, but yeah. that's kind of the only word that I have easy access to right yeah. now. But however, um, there is this. There are a couple of star systems that are um, brought up a lot. Oh, that's true. As and well, that's yeah. a, um, Zeta Reticuli, whatever it's called. Yeah. And somewhere near Orion, those two places are always brought up. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I don't really know enough about it to sort of say, okay, yeah, that's conclusive. But yeah. I wonder how much, when 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 people keep bringing up the same star systems, I wonder if they bring it up only because they've heard someone else bring yeah. it up. You know, <laughs> that's if, it. if there's a Chinese whispers element to it. Yeah, I don't know. Zeta reticuli. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, there's some stuff that's like, it seems so bullshit, like, and it's so easy to laugh at. Mm. And I was like laughing yesterday. I, w- I watched this thing where um, it's this dude was interviewing people that believe that they, or they claim, at the very least, they claim to speak to aliens. Right. And it's like, it's so ridiculous that it's like they're being fucked with. Yeah, because right. they they start to channel, right? And they go, hello, my name is Nebulon. <laughs> I come from th- this planetary system we've come to tell you people of earth and they have this kind of like grand message okay. you know, it's something that sounds so 50s or 60s sci-fi Just big it's grade. ridiculous yeah, yeah. and it's like what's what could possibly make you think that if you're faking it right mm. i'm thinking to myself what could possibly make you think that people aren't just purely mocking you either they're nuts or and this is something that like a recurring thing that's brought up. Yeah. That there's a type of either alien or being out there that seems to really enjoy fucking with humans. Just messing with them. Yeah. Just screwing with their like it's like they they exploit their weaknesses, you know? Like if someone's already a bit weird Okay, or oh, like check out this guy. Let's like, you know, <laughs> let's put on the antennas and and walk around his backyard. <laughs> that sounds a little bit Rick and Morty. I, I know, but it's but that just that that just seems to be coming up again and again and again. Like there seems to be a sign of that. Like if one day we find out, okay, yes, there are other races that exist in other dimensions or are hidden or or, or that are, are present somehow. Yeah, I would not be surprised if there seems to be a more like one of these races are in a sense or in a way like insidious or um, they just enjoy fucking with, with people for some reason. It just sounds like they're just, just kind of dicks. Yeah. It sort of remind, reminds me of... Um, Maybe it's like 
Uh, but look, if, if you were to put like an agenda behind it, maybe their agenda is to hide their presence by just seem, by seeming implausible through making the whole subject something worth mocking. Interesting. Which raises a whole bunch of other questions. But I was going to say, this whole scenario of aliens kind of just fucking with people because they can. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit of uh, that song by Tool off the album 10,000 Days, uh, Rosetta Stoned. And Tool fans will know the song, but it's it's the lyrics are actually pretty funny. It's just about a dude who... Is, drops a bunch of acid and seems like he has a, a very very real experience with uh, with a UFO, mm-hmm. and um, the story takes place as he's kind of tied down in a hospital bed because he's seems to be the victim of a psychosis. But from his point of view, he seems to be quite um, aware of what's happening, yeah. but not in control of himself because it's just you know. References to him shitting the bed and stuff, you know. Yeah. So like, it sounds very tall. Like he's been fucked with. Yeah, it's it's very very tall. Yeah. But um, yeah, the alien in this this scenario, um, you know, tells him that he he is the chosen one, and he has to a message to tell that he has to get out, but he just he can't fucking remember what what it is. <laughs> so it's, it's like this it. this big joke that's been played on him and everyone else, you know. Yeah. I know it's bizarre, but that's. I don't know. I get the feeling that there's a, I get the feeling that there's a, um, a mischievous, kind of element out there somewhere. And there's a, there's an element of like, of like, um, torture. And then there's an element of like, like wanting to bang humans. <laughs> I wonder if that maybe explains the different personalities of the ancient pantheons say of like ancient Greek and the ancient Romans, how, you know, like that, that deity Loki is mischievous and fucks with people. And, you know, you got, you got different, different gods, you know, on this yeah. pantheon that have, they seem to have different personalities and stuff. I wonder is if, if that's fucking compelling, if they are aliens, <laughs> are they different aliens or are they just aliens right. with different personalities? That's it. Was there a time yeah. when, human contact with these these uh, beings or these creatures were was far more mm. commonplace maybe did we just get a little too sophisticated yeah a bit too clever and a little bit too sure of ourselves to be able to maintain an open dialogue who knows and you know what that's the biggest question or do these things just want to want to be seen as gods exactly and when we, when we were when humans no longer were, were were so willing to do that were they like well fuck you guys yeah and that's the thing that that is the big question like what do they want what is their motivation that and that's the thing that is so confusing because like okay let's fly around in the sky and let's land in a in like a in a school oval and hang out there for 20 minutes um and then just fly off yeah like what's up with that that happened in melbourne that happened. Um, really? That happened about maybe uh, I think in the se- yeah it happened in the seventies or something like that. Oh, that that sounds familiar. I, yeah. I feel like I've heard that. Story. And an entire school, like two a primary school and a middle school, I think, saw it. They saw like everyone in that area, like because it was during a lunch break or something. Everyone saw like UFOs in the sky. One landed. Um, some kids went to investigate. There was a girl that was already there, and she was hysterical. And no, and like she was in hysterics, like couldn't talk, yeah, right. nothing. She was like, she'd gone nuts. And her friend from the school um, went to her house. like, And this is after the police and the military came and told them to shut up. She went to her house, the girl that was hysterical, and a different family lived there. This is something that you, it was on one of those... um. What's that stupid panel show that's on Channel 10 during the mornings? It's got like a bunch of like ladies. It's, a, it's like The View, but, uh, but the Australian version. I'm, I'm out of touch with yeah, it's, it's the terrible. daytime TV. But, but they interviewed like four people, four, like three of the ladies that were there. Oh, really? When they, in, yeah, and they're just like, it happened. Like, it doesn't matter what anyone says. It happened. And, they, they, and one of them was telling this story about this... Um, this cover up that happened, you know. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's intense. And anyway, they her her parents uh, were like Czechoslovakian or something. Right. And so eventually, 
they were able to track this lady down as an adult. Yeah. But she still refused to talk about it. Shit. Yeah. So, like, that's a big question, isn't it? Like, what the hell are they thinking? You know, are they? Are they? A lot of people say, "Oh, they they're here watching us and examining us." But no, it seems like they're they're feeding themselves through different things. It's like there's different things that they're getting from us that they that they either enjoy or they want. It's it's like we're in some ways it feels like we're livestock, and they pluck us from the, from our beds at night and and like, like I'm getting into real paranoid territory, but like. <laughs> I know. I, I like speculating, right? Yeah, yeah. They pluck us from our beds and they'll do things to that are extremely tra- traumatizing, you know, and then they'll just wipe our memories of it. And then, you know, you have hypnotherapy and you remember all this shit they've done to you and it's like, what? Why? <laughs> Why do they keep pulling cows up from the fields and, and, you know, draining all their blood and then just leaving them in pieces on a field, you know, without a single drop of blood around them? That's really, really strange. I, it's like, I, come on, man. What's your deal? <laughs> I've listened to a few skeptical podcasts about, okay. about that sort of stuff. And um, they've occasionally they come up with compelling explanations for it, but it's not necessarily that satisfying. Like, um, There was one skeptical podcaster that was saying, uh, I'm sort of trying to remember what he said now, but he he was um, he he reckoned that under certain conditions animals can die, and their blood can drain out, or their blood can just pull on the underside of the carcass because there's no more circulation. So it can appear that the tissues that have been the tissues closer to the top of the carcass, however, it's lying appear to be exsanguinated because all the blood has just flowed to the bottom. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. But I mean, then, um, as that, that... Come on, that, that seems like really lazy skepticism. It feels a bit, like a bit like it's reaching because surely if you flip the animal over, you will see that yeah. the bottom of the animal would have collected all the blood, you know, yeah. if it was something like that. Um, I don't know, like apparently they, they, they do really strange things to, to, to cows. Yeah. When they find them, like the genitals are cut out, you know. Yeah. Um, it's strange. Uh, I certainly can't explain it. Um, I, I actually, I do remember one thing that is really scary. Actually, this is this is actually like properly this is actually <laughs> proper nightmare fuel. Right. Um, years and years and years ago, I was listening to a podcast called uh, Truth News Australia when I was I was first flirting with uh, with being a truther myself. Uh huh. And this this guy who has a pretty pretty interesting podcast. Um, he had um, a guest on. Some some lady was talking about this exact same thing about um, exsanguinated livestock, and she reckons there's cases in England where they found people exsanguinated. Oh shit! As well, in the same manner as livestock. <laughs> I could look into that. Yeah, and of course it's. You know, thank you, thank you for teaching me a new word as well. Exsanguinated. Exsanguinated, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that's kind of a scary thing. And she didn't actually Damn. go on to say much about it. She like it just it just kind of disappeared under the usual cloud of government conspiracy and yeah. Nye, oh. nye, nye, nye. Okay, fine. But Sometimes it's so frustrating, you would just want them to like if you've ever watched a podcast with Alex Jones and he just goes on these rants. All right. Alex these, Jones. He goes on these crazy rants. It's like, come on, man, stop, okay? I want to hear about, like, the these hybrids, you know? <laughs> he goes from hybrids to, sort of, like, Hillary Clinton in two seconds. And it's like, damn it, I need to... Yeah. But the thing is, there's going to be a link between Hillary Clinton and these hybrids. Yeah, he's trying to get to you that know? point. Now, actually, a, a really good one that yeah. he did was actually when he was um, interviewed on the Joe Rogan show. Yeah. Joe Rogan... Those are amazing. Yeah, has he done two? He did two. Yeah, and Joe Rogan, I think I, actually I might have heard both of them by now, but Joe Rogan does an incredible job of kind of just reining in yeah. Alex Jones's crazy. Alex Jones Do you know seems to be the funniest like, thing? By the end of the podcast, he doesn't seem that crazy. Yeah. 
Well, that's the thing. Like, it's a, you have to listen to it for yourself. It's like Joe Rogan, like, was finally the one person that was taking him seriously. Yeah. <laughs> so, by the end of it, he's just he's kind of dialed down yeah. the anxious craziness, and yeah. he's kind of starting to string sentences together that are yeah. a little bit more sensical. But yeah. it's it's really interesting. And like, I found out that he's not a conservative. He's like a, he's he's a Trump hater. Oh yeah. Yeah. I oh, totally yeah. <laughs> Which is really interesting. Like as soon as yeah, the, everyone sees him as a. I always thought he was a conservative, but he's he's not. He's just like a yeah. He's a man on a mission. He is he's, yeah. yeah. A very very single minded mission. It's yeah. It's not really about politics with him. It's yeah. it's about it's about something overarching. It's about the biggest story in the world. Yeah, yeah. That you can't even put into words. <laughs> hey, he's been trying. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'd look, to be fair, I haven't heard that much Alex Jones. I mean, the only yeah, the only time I've actually given him given him any time really um, was on the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, and then before that, I've been exposed to you know literally ten thousand memes about him. Yeah. So I, I just probably like ninety nine percent of the people out there just thought of him as a bit of a, a bit of a fool, just a bit yeah. of a strange, look, strange just- crazy guy, you know. He like everything about him is out of context. Even if you're like in there in front of him and you're looking at the context, he doesn't provide any. Yeah, you're looking for context, so he just says a whole bunch of mad sounding stuff. But like, if you look into each one of those things separately, it's all based on stuff that's public. Pub, like you can yeah. you can access that information because you you know like <laughs> Alex Jones is like thought process it's kind of like batman solving a riddle you know (laughs) just make these weird leaps of logic like non sequitur after non sequitur to somehow you know sherlock holmes's way into proving that it was the joker all along or something you know that's kind of how alex jones rants is just if you don't if you don't know what he's actually talking about it sounds batshit Yeah. yeah but okay let's go back to let's go back to the ufos Right. Okay, this is something that just came to mind. It, it's an example of one of those things that should be just like... Scientists should be like climbing and scrambling over each other to figure out what this shit is. Right. You know, like... When I was in high school, one of the first sort of semi-viral videos were just... You know, E-bombs world, you could watch like yeah, yeah. weird and cool videos and, and just stuff like that. Yep. Um, there was this one dude... Who's like, I guess he was like a, uh, what do they call them? The, like he's a black Israelite or something? Oh. Something like that. Anyway, he calls himself like Yahweh or uh, I can't remember exactly. Right. Anyway, this dude, he would like, sp- he would speak in gibberish and he could make orbs appear in the sky. Right. And so um, <coughs> a news crew went out with him to a place that they chose all right, it should still be on on the internet. It should you could you should be able to find it on on YouTube. But it's this black guy, and he's like, you know, and he I think he calls God Yahweh. I think that's right. That's 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 the thing. That's okay. where the connection is. Yep. Anyway, he starts. Um, um, I'm not sure if he's speaking in Hebrew or if he's just like, um, you know, speaking jibber jabber. Might be ancient Aramaic or something, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It it just sounds like it's going and like within a couple of minutes, the news camera points to the sky, and I have to remind you once again. They put him into a car. They drove to a location of their choice at their time right. at the time that they chose, and they said, "All right, do it now," and he did it. And so, like, the cameras point up, and there's there's a friggin' orb just above them. No fucking way. Yeah. You should um, you should find a link to that. Yeah, and I have to find it, a link. In- include it in the the description for this podcast. Yeah. Because <laughs> aside from just hearing yeah. my, my own wonderful voice, I'm, I want to go back and, and watch that video, man. That that sounds. Yeah. That sounds and, off the hook. And I think he's, he's still kicking. But that's just one of those things. Well, that, that, just... that, that dude. Yeah, yeah. The, the, but, or, the orb summoner. Yeah. Wow. It's incredible. Shit. And it's like, who gives, no one gives a crap about that. 
you know? It's and there's like heaps of stuff. Have you heard of the lights over Phoenix? No, not specifically. That's a recent thing where How recent? Uh like Let me just look I'm going to I need a fact check. Do, do some internet fact checking. Yep. Yeah. 1997. Okay. A, there were a series of, it says here, the Phoenix lights were a series of widely sighted, unidentified flying objects or UFOs observed in the skies over the US states of Arizona, Nevada, and the Mexican state of Sonora on March 13, 1997. Everyone fucking saw it. Yeah. It was yeah. like one of those things that's ridiculously obvious. Anyway, the. Um, the Three mili- states Arizona, Nevada, and yeah. then south into Mexico. Yeah. Okay. Everyone saw it. And. What the military said was like, oh, they were just like flares. <laughs> That's the best kind of story they could come up with. Well, we click on that first link, skeptic.com, yeah. saying that so so few sightings have been so thoroughly Look, investigated heard- by reporters and so well debunked. Like that's, <sighs> like, like, what, what's their debunking like? Well, that's a di- that's a different podcast. It is, yeah, but but look, uh, look, I've heard a lot of the um yes. the rhetoric of these uh, debunkers, yeah, and they just buy the words of of what the military say. They're like, yeah, it was it was just a they were just flares, you know. They do the old Occam's razor. Yeah, Occam's razor. Yeah, I don't know. Flares only last a few seconds for something to be seen across three states. Mm. Well, two two American states and then south into moving around in formation. That that suggests something that lasted yeah. more than a few seconds. But anyway, that's one yeah. example of many. Because sure. in Denmark, over a short period of time, there were a crapload of UFOs yeah. sighted, and everyone's talking about it. But you know, it never makes it. Well, far. Apparently, uh, well, look, look, Mexico City. Like apparently, the, like the sky is just crawling with UFOs. Apparently, yeah, like you could just. Fine, you just go walk out in the street and, and see UFOs. But it's it's funny, like, even when the US Navy, like, officially states that UFOs exist, they've, they've, um, they've changed the name of it. It's UAP now, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. <laughs> they've changed the name of it. Okay. Um, they have acknowledged it. And you see it on a couple of news shows, and then you never hear of it ever again. You know, yeah, it's so frustrating because <laughs> I want to know. I guess it's it's that whole sort of soft disclosure thing you've been talking about recently. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like the um, soft disclosure is a way of slowly acclimatizing people to a, a really reality shaking concept. Yeah, that's going to stop people from uh, going hysterical. So you you give them bits and bits at a time. It's like that um, news article. Where do, it appeared in some American online news thing. Yeah. About the US Army is they just there was a just a short little piece about how the US Army is now gonna use UFO technology in, in something. Yeah. Uh, just really matter of fact, yeah, they're gonna use UFO technology. Yeah. You know, and then the, the the press release statement is like, Yeah, we're gonna be using UFO technology, blah blah blah. Uh okay, that that's all for today. Everyone have a good day. Yeah. Um <laughs> Or like or like um how just, earlier this year uh, what's his name? The guy from Blink-182? Yeah. He quit the band to start this kind of UFO alien, what do you call it? Like Academy? Yeah, it's called the, it's it's called something like To The Stars Academy, something like that. What? Yeah. And he has a contract with the government that is available online. You can, you can see this contract that they have. A contract for what? To reverse engineer the materials of um, alien aircraft. Uh... And that is as blatant as it's stated as well. Because yeah. what they've been doing up until now is that they've been trying to find like people like Bob Lazar, where they're like a sort of no name um, yet sort of promising physicist or yeah. scientist yeah. to try and um, reverse engineer these UFOs. And if anything bad happens, because they're not someone who have, they're not like a scientist with any actual influence. Um, they can just destroy their lives. They can make them disappear. They can make their career disappear easily. Well, yeah, that Bob Lazar documentary is really compelling. Yeah. Because they've, they've done everything they possibly can to discredit him. Yeah. And, and they, he, they forgot to do a few things, <laughs> which and, is and so stupid. Yeah, they, they didn't tie up. Yeah, there's a few sort of untied loose ends. But yeah, Bob Lazar <clears throat> just seems to be quite 
quite a genuine fellow. He doesn't seem yeah. like he's a, a crazy nut job. In fact, he kind of looks like he just wants to live a quiet life. He's a bit of a dork, right? And he's not the type of person that it's going to get. He's not. He's not like an influential sort of person. Yeah, he doesn't have that that charisma to be a uh, yeah a celebrity. And I think that's exactly the type of person they're looking for when they when they let someone in on a secret. Yeah, they find someone that's a bit like you know that's going to be easily ignored. Yeah, gotten or gotten rid of, gotten rid of or discredited, and it's probably just far easier to discredit somebody than having to orchestrate yeah. a disappearance. Yeah, perhaps I don't know. Who knows how these people think? Yeah, exactly. Mm. I, th- I think that's the best thing they could do. That's the most powerful thing they can do. Leave one, leave a crazy, a, leave a crazy man with his crazy story, you know. Yep, for the skeptics to go, ah, uh, crazy man. Yeah. So, okay, so just to restate this, the the guitarist from Blink One Eighty Two, what's his name? Tom DeLong, was it? No, Tom DeLong, yeah. Right. He has an academy called To the Stars. To the Stars. I think. Let me. And To the Stars has a contract with the US government to reverse engineer alien technology. Yes. And all of this information is published through major news um, publishers. Right. Now, the fact that they've got Tom DeLong, who is the guitarist from a... Well, that's that's another thing that makes it sound band. stupid, right? I know. It's, it's, it's ludicrous. Like, why? But this guy has been serious about UFOs... And he invested all of his money. He was at the point of bankruptcy. Wow. Because all of his... Because like Blink-182 made a shit ton of cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially because he was like the um, main songwriter. One of the main songwriters. Yeah. And he put millions into this to the Stars Academy. He was so won over by it. And he just comes across as a crazy guy. So it's just easy. So they're like, hey, let's choose this guy. It's It's like... Because I was talking to a friend and I'm like, what do you think about this? And he's like, well, come on. It's the guy from Blink-182. Come on. As if as if that's like, you know. It's far too easy to do that. Yeah. It's far too easy to say that. But it's genius. That's such a great, that would be such a great way of um, of covering your trail slightly, you know, by giving people this sense of kind of, ugh, you know. That, that is, that, that's just bananas, man. Yeah. That that's that's one of the craziest things I've ever heard of, <laughs> and uh, I'll be interested to see how this develops. Yeah, if, if people are going to re- remember the To the Stars Academy, because it's such a silly name as well. It's, it's to the stars. It's yeah. kind of dorky, you know. It's just like yeah. to the library, Excelsior, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um. Just strange. Yeah. Have you heard of Skinwalker Ranch? I have. What have you heard about it? Well, I'd like to read up a little bit on Skinwalker Ranch because I've that, yeah I've, I've I've heard a little bit about it. It's come up in some of my skeptical and otherwise podcasts that yeah. I've heard over the years. That is another huge conversation. It so. is, yeah. That, that's so like we're, we're going to have to wrap. We're almost running out of time. Yeah, but. okay. Uh, I'd look. I'd love to come back and, and yeah. just talk some more about this stuff. That is crazy. That's a, yeah. There's because there's also cryptozoology that we've got to get into. Oh yeah, and that's a that's again that's a whole other Encyclopedia Britannica's yeah. worth of of <laughs> amazing. Strange, compelling yeah. stuff. Men with with dog heads. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> people with dog heads. Yeah. And like... Um, uh, hang on, hang on. People whose heads are dogs. Like dogs' heads on people. Yeah. So human body from the neck down. Yep. Neck up. Yep. It's a poodle. I don't, I don't know if it's or, a poodle. Or a, a terrier or... But like, as in, you know, just to give you a little taster of what's to come with this with this whole Skinwalker Ranch, um, uh, Skinwalker Ranch is like the number one paranormal hotspot in America. At one point, they sent a bunch of science. Someone finally funded a bunch of scientists to to monitor and to study it. Okay, and one of the little um, stories that happened during that time is that a dude was walking around after seeing a portal open. And he saw two dudes in trench coats having a cigarette, talking to each other. They turned around and looked at him, and they both had the heads of dogs. And then he something happened where like he looked away for a second and they were gone. And the only thing that le- was left behind was um, a couple of smokes on the ground. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. So, so the, these these people. Let's let's call them people. Actually, uh-huh. no, I, I don't think it's unfair Look, to call them. Google people. it. And throughout time, I think they're all people. Throughout time, dog-headed humanoids have appeared. Anubis. Everything. Yeah. All the way until until now. That's it's freaking weird, man. That that is very very strange. <laughs> yeah. But but it's it's on an equal level of strangeness too. A lot of medieval illustrations and even Renaissance uh, era, yeah, um, what do they call it, um, camera obscura type paintings and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. that have UFOs in them. Yeah, orbs in the sky floating around, cigar shaped objects. There's even there's one illustration that even has like this big triangular thing, a black mm-hmm. triangular thing that looks. It looks like a fucking um, imperial cruiser from Star yeah. Wars. There's a montage of all those paintings at the start of the Witness of Another World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you quickly Google the, the title so you can get the actual accurate title there? Yeah, Witness of Another World. Yeah, Witness of Another World. Yeah. Um, and it looks like it came out this year, actually. It looks like it came out in July. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I went through a phase out. of watching as many UFO documentaries as possible. Right. And I was like, man, I, I sort of ran out of stuff. <laughs> Even though I'm sure there's heaps I haven't seen, but like the stuff that I could easily find. Yep. And I just did a search for what is the best UFO documentary. <laughs> and they said, witness of another world. It's actually very, very good because yeah. it's, I think we've all grown up with kind of weird, dorky UFO documentaries mm-hmm. with weird music and poorly recorded voiceover and stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but this is actually, um, it's it's got high production values, which helps in telling the story a lot. Yeah. Um, so, aside from... That looks, and it's it's shot stunningly, like... Yeah, actually, the um, the reenactment shots um, yeah. are actually, like, they've got a bit of a dreamlike quality to them, but I think that's probably necessary for the, the storytelling. Yeah. But uh, it, it all looks very nice. It's all done... Cool. Very nicely. It's it's yeah. Look, just watch it. It's very. very yeah, I'm gonna finish watching it. If you're interested in in aliens and and the paranormal, it's a yeah. it's an excellent uh, stepping stone. Yeah. Well, next time next time you come back, we're gonna talk Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch and and cryptozoology. Yeah. And um, we should also delve into uh, sleep apnea. Look, every single time uh, you're talking about. Um, about sleep, sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis. Yeah. So far, every single um, podcast I've done, someone mentioned sleep paralysis. It's incredible. Yeah. Even though there's like a, a scientific sort of explanation, there is still a, an aspect to it which seems to be not right. It's there's a there's a shared hallucination factor that happens. That's well, that's I, I really think, fucked up. I think Dan, who is is uh, somebody that you you've already had. Yeah, Dan, we Dan, go through that. Dan Silvestri, he's got a, a sleep uh, a sleep paralysis story. Yeah. I've got a recurring sleep paralysis story. Yeah, which we'll go into next time I come back. Okay, so maybe we can save that for next time. All right. Um, but yeah, looking like, for Martin Part Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, thanks a lot for having me on, man. This has yeah. been really fun. Yeah, it's been awesome. Bye bye. See you later. You've been listening to the Fear of the Unknown podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media with all links in the description.